Welcome to Syntax. On this Monday Hasty Treat, we're going to be talking about six amazing new JavaScript proposals that are, well, they're on their various stages, some of which are at stage three, some of which are at two point something. These are just going to be things that are upcoming in JavaScript that you should probably know about now. Uh, that way you can either potentially help prepare for them being ready. Maybe you can learn some of these things ahead of time, or maybe you can even get involved in the discussion about how these things things end up actually in the browser. My name is Scott Talinsky. I'm a developer from Denver. And with me, as always, is Wes Boss. What's up, Wes? Hey, just having a Pepsi peach. Pepsi peach. I got to get one of these, Wes. S so good. It's so good. It's They've been like having a bunch of weird... Canada is, is known for having like weird flavors of like chips, but it All seems to have spilled in out stuff. into the yeah ketchup. But like also like like off the chain flavors too, you know, like we have like butter chicken and that's not really off the chain, Butter yeah, chicken is like the, the most white guy ever, but we have lots of like very interesting chips, but it's like spilled out into pops now. So now we've got Pepsi peach, which I really like it. Big fan. <sighs> peach is my all time favorite fruit. It is my really? favorite flavor. Uh, given the option for peach, anything, I will choose peach. If it were at ice cream, it's peach. Yeah. Uh, peach is pretty yeah. good. Fuzzy it's my peach. flavor. What about the pe fuzzy peach candy? Oh, c please. Yeah. G give me give me a whole giant bag of those. Uh, yes, please. But it looks yeah. like, Wes, it does look like they have Pepsi Peach at King Supers just down the street from me. I could okay. walk and get some Pepsi Peach today. All right. So, After this. Yes. All right. Well, uh, we've got six new JavaScript proposals to talk about today. Like Scott says, some of them are at different stages of the uh, the proposal. And I'll show you this real quick of like, what are the stages of getting something added to ECMAScript? So TC39 is the committee that oversees what language features to add. So they are not in charge of like web APIs. Um, which is like, like oh, the fetch is being added to the browser or mm -hmm. um, web workers or something like that. But they are in charge of like core language features, which is like async await and, and new variables and how regexes work and like stuff like that, right? And there's, a, I guess, five stages that you can go through. Zero is just a proposal. Uh, one is under consideration. So like anybody can propose something at stage zero. And then one is under consider consideration. Um, they'll often like be proposed to at a, at a meeting. Um, it's kind of interesting to look at the slide decks of those meetings because often those are where the initial ideas sort of start. And then it goes into two. That's when they've chosen their preferred solution, but they still need to like sort of chew on it and go through what does the API look like? Is this really something we want to do? Uh, and then 2.7. I don't know if this is new or not, but there's quite a few in 2.7. Hmm. They probably had to add a, no a new step between two and three, and that's why we have that. Yeah, it does seem like the stuff that occasionally in that two to three range can yeah. sometimes feel like the Bermuda Triangle where it just like goes in and never comes out, right? Yeah, so they're just testing and validation. So I guess that's like the it's it's implemented, it's done, but now we need to like make sure that it it passes all of the use cases out there. And then there's three, which is has been rec recommended for implementation. Generally, once something hits three, you can say, okay, this is going to happen. Usually, stuff at two point seven <laughs> will also happen, but there are many cases where they've been clawed back both at two point seven and three, and then four yeah. is. It's part of the language. Yeah, famously decorators clawed back. Exactly, yeah. The first one we have here is promise.try. Um, mm. It seems like the promise API just keeps getting uh, new little nuggets and new little like handy <laughs> things added to, to it. And these things are not groundbreaking. However, they are nice. So what is promise.try is when you have a function that may or may not be a promise, but you still want to run, you still want to await it, you still want to <laughs> dot then it, and you still want to dot catch any errors it could possibly throw, which is really cool because the dot catch API is nice. And what if you could use the dot catch API for things that were not promises, right? And yeah. there's ways that you can go around it now, or you can use like promise.resolve and, and that will 
then you can put your function in there and that will that will give it to you. But this promise.try is simply just a native API to do that type of thing. So huh. yeah, big fan. I, th- I think that that will probably make it. It's currently in stage three. It seems pretty um, low stakes. It does seem nice. Yeah. I honestly had never heard of this. So it's got. that's what I love about doing these episodes because I feel like I look at this repo all the time of new proposals. Yeah. I've never, never seen this one. So yeah. And Sick. like people love the belly ache after things have been added to the language. Yeah. So like check it out now, you know? And also it's, it's interesting to read these because you understand the why behind something. So for example, the next one, math.sum yes. precise. <laughs> yes. I love um, this. Yes. If you wanted to add up a list of numbers in JavaScript right now, what are your options? Probably, what would you reach for, Scott? Yeah. I mean, I would just use the just normal the normal math inside of the normal operators, and then just truncate if the if the the number has gone off the rails and added a whole bunch of extra decimals when it shouldn't or whatever. You know, you know, math and JavaScript is one of those things that I guess a lot of people don't realize that it's uh, not super reliable in terms of being exact and yeah. some precise gives you that assurance that the sum that you're going to be doing will be precise. Now, the reason why it's sum precise and not sum is that they want people to understand that this is a more expensive operation than just yes. sum this up. So by putting sum precise, it, it does feel like, all right, this is a, a more intense operation than just the generic sum. Yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting how they had to n- explicitly name it that because yes. it could be so like the other alternative is like we don't have math dot sum in javascript you have to use a reduce yeah. which to is kind of sum, annoying yeah. to add them all together so ma- i kind of wish that we had dot sum just for it just like short shorted it yeah. to yeah. the reduce but like you'll know that if, if like scott said if you are adding up numbers it could be not very precise uh, which can be an issue so this goes lower level it has an algorithm behind it and you're not going to get those lol um, <laughs> yes lol JavaScript 0.1 yeah. plus 0.2 yeah. equals here what is the thing that everybody uses here uh the classic 0.1 plus 0.2 is equal <laughs> to zero so like <laughs> there oh. i have a let's find this there we String. go oh my Window gosh that's so funny I, every time somebody lols this I just tell them to write this code. Window.location is equal to HTTPS 0.1 plus 0.2.com. And you put it in and it goes to a website explaining how floating point math no, and how it is I... not an issue with JavaScript. And it's how it floating is. point math specifically. It's, it's I, like, I don't understand enough about this. So it, it goes down to like the CPU. Like this is just how computers wow. work. So, yeah, I, it, it, you know, what? if we're being entirely honest, Wes, I don't know if I know why a float is called a float. I don't I don't think I've ever paid attention to anything other than that's how you use decimals. Yeah, float because um, it's floating because it has. <laughs> that's a good question. Why is it a float? Why is a floating point number called a float? Because decimal point can float to different positions within the number representation, allowing the numbers to have a wide range of values. Floating point numbers are use a fixed number of bits to represent a wide range of values, with the decimal point allowed to float to different mm. positions. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. It I didn't know that either. Anywhere, yeah. Huh. Uh, so that is in stage 2.7. Next one we have here, Shadow Realm. It's a great name. Looks really cool. So the idea with the Shadow Realm is that you can essentially make your own global scope in JavaScript without having to move to another execution context. So a Shadow DOM in the browser is essentially you can create your own DOM that is mm-hmm. cannot be tainted by anything else in there. You sort of have your own little sandbox where you can run everything, but it is still part of the actual DOM. Whereas a Shadow Realm is a whole JavaScript execution context that cannot be tainted by 
other things. So why might that be useful? Well, uh, if you have global scope on something, if you're importing some third-party code, you're importing some testing code, you have one global scope. And if those things monkey with the global scope, <laughs> then uh, like a very simple example is if there's two variables that both have the same name, then you're kind of pooched, right? So this will allow you to import third-party code into it. They have a whole bunch of different examples of like uh, DOM virtualization. So right mm, now, if you wow, want to yeah. do DOM virtualization, a lot of people will put it in a web worker, which is a, another context. But a web worker is not the same as a just the regular JavaScript DOM API. So you don't have the same set of APIs. And sometimes, and there's also like this expense of sending data from your regular DOM API to a web worker, like you have mm -hmm. to cross the bridge. And if you're sending a lot of data back and forth, it could be a bottleneck. So this will allow you to, to do that. Some other examples, template libraries, code base segmentation, virt virtual DOM, virtual env environment. So again, this is probably not something you're going to be using every single day, but I, I know there is a subsection of developers who work on tooling being like, yes, give me Shadow Realm. Yeah, no kidding. Plus, it sounds sick. Like, it like sounds it's, like, sick. It sounds like a game, you know? Like, oh, man, I stayed up till 3 a.m. last night playing Shadow Realm. Yes, Shadow Realm, Shadow Dom, all that stuff. Shadow Dom the Hedgehog. I, I, I love all this stuff. So, yeah, just being able to scope by creating new context is, is pretty fantastic. And if you want to see all of the errors in your application, you'll want to check out Sentry at sentry.io forward slash syntax. You don't want a production application out there that... Well, you have no visibility into in case something is blowing up and you might not even know it. So head on over to century.io forward slash syntax. Again, we've been using this tool for a long time and it totally rules. All right. Uh, next one is proposal regex escape. Now, oh man, regex, one of those things that <laughs> I, I go straight to chat GPT for. Uh, can you tell me what regex escape does? <laughs> yeah, so often you will have a string that you want to put into a regex. But if mm. that regex has like uh, a period in it, you will have to escape that period because a period or a forward slash or any of those characters mean something to a regex, whereas you just want it as text. So mm -hmm. now with regex.escape, it will simply take the input and allow you to it will escape those for you. So at a very basic level, if you are writing a uh, regex looking for, like for example, in the syntax website, I have a regex that looks for the end of a sentence. And what it does is it looks for both a period and a new line. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I put a period in there and I have to escape the actual period because it's not just a... Um, what is the period in regex? It matches like one or, or more characters, something like that. So yeah, you don't have to escape them. This will escape it for you. That's it. Wow. That's nice and a <laughs> little simple utility. You know, that's the type of thing that I, uh, I need <laughs> because anything to make regex easier for me. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, next one we have here is deferred module evaluation or lazy module initialization. This is kind of cool because if you have a module where some work is done when the module is loaded, um, so maybe mm. you create like a cache or maybe you go off and fetch some data, that will run as soon as the module has been required, right? It goes through the entire require tree and as soon as it loads, that code will actually run. So if you don't want that to happen, you have to switch your require syntax, right? You have to switch from like this require to you have to put it inside of an actual function. Or if you're using the import, probably you're using ESM import, you have to switch from the top level import to a on demand import inside of a function, mm. which is annoying because then your build tooling might not know about it, you know, and that's a big pain in the butt as well. So the deferred evaluation will simply allow you to mark a import as deferred, meaning that it will not execute the yes. code in that thing until yes. it is actually needed. So again, give me that one of those handy dandy little things. 
Yeah, I always I, that is always a thing. It's like you do all these imports, and you're like, well, this doesn't even get run on initialization. Why Why do I need this code right now? Um, and yes. Sometimes it's handy to just have it available. Um, so giving you that control would be great. Next one is proposal iterator sequencing. And that kind of sounds like, uh, it kind of is what it sounds like. <laughs> it allows you to create iterators by sequencing existing iterators. Uh, why would what? you use this? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, like a so an iterator. I I feel like I've explained this a million times on the podcast, but I'm gonna do it again because do it. Uh, I don't think a lot of people understand what an iterator is. Um, in JavaScript, if you have a sequence of values um, or you have a collection of data in JavaScript, you might be thinking, "Yeah, that's a that's an array, Wes. We have that already." <laughs> However. If you want a custom data type, or there are other custom data types in JavaScript, you have, obviously we have arrays, but we have maps and sets. You have uh, node lists. There's lots of different types of iterators in JavaScript that is a, essentially a collection of data. And often you will want to loop over each of those items in your iterator. And we see a lot of people when they need to loop over, you do the whole spread it into an array or convert it array.from or you do something to move it into an array. Well, in the last year or two, we've been getting a lot of these helper methods on on the iterator prototype so that you don't ha have to convert it to an array to, to even work with it. Plus, like an, another benefit of an, an iterator is that I iterator has this like cool you can use like you of course can use like a for in or mm. for of api mm -hmm. in it but you can also use the dot next api inside of it like it's a generator um, and it can also tell you when you're done and return a value from that that iterator as well which is really really nifty so what is iterator sequencing it's a fancy way to mm -hmm. say you can concatenate multiple iterators together into a single long iterator. So if you were thinking of it as an array, you have three arrays of data and you want to make them into one big array, the, that does the exact same thing with uh, iterator sequencing. Huh. Okay. And that is what we have. That one is currently in stage two right now. So we might see it change. But again, I think a lot of these kind of APIs have been making their way into into the iterator prototype and i think we'll probably see it in the next six months or so wow well i love i love this stuff it gives me an idea about what's coming even if even if maybe all these aren't entirely useful to me i think definitely some of them will get quite a bit of use so mm -hmm. yeah sick all right that's it for today thanks everybody for tuning in we will catch you later peace